Morning, everybody. Yeah. Hope everybody's doing well. Uh, we are at the final week. We've made it. So, uh, what we're going to do today is we are going to wrap up our discussion of C containers. So, we've already talked about factors, we've talked about forward list, we've talked about list, and we've talked about stacks. So, now we're going to build off of this idea a little further. And we're going to discuss an idea of what's known as a queue. So a stack, what we covered on Wednesday in review briefing on Friday, is this idea of a last in, first out component. The queue is first in, first out. So it's just like waiting in line. So we call that FIFO. And the whole idea of a queue is it's a list of elements where a new element is enqueued in one end onto the list and then dequeued on the other. The only two elements that you can access at any given moment with a queue are at the beginning and at the end. So queues typically build off of doubly linked lists. And the reason they do is because with a singly linked list, we had a head node, right? That was pointing to that initial node. And we were able to insert and push onto the front. And with a double linked list, we were able to put elements at the beginning and the end. And we were able to remove elements from the beginning. So with a queue, what we're doing is we're taking that idea of a doubly linked list and we're saying, all right, if I have an initial doubly linked list, let me bring up a blank sheet here. So I would have a head and a tail node. And if I put one element in, they're both going to point at them at the same. But if I put on them, push on the back, then what's going to happen is that's going to be pointing at the tail node. And if I put in another one, I push on the back, like so. And it'll be the same thing. Oop. Like so. So that maintains this doubly linked list. And what the queue does is it says, all right, I'm going to be able to read the element at the end because I can access this particular node with this pointer. And likewise, I can access the front. So what we're actually doing is we're just deleting from the end and pushing back onto the, uh, sorry, we're pushing onto the end and deleting from the front. So what ends up happening is it acts as a line. So anything where you need to have some sort of uh, sorting where you have to keep them in the order that you put them in, a queue becomes very useful. So if you were to progress on into other computer science classes, you would learn about graphs and there's a form of search on a graph called breadth first search. And the whole idea is a breadth first search is if you were trying to figure out how to get from one place to another, it's on a map. Right? So if I know, okay, well, I'm looking at a map here and I have, I can go in these three directions and then from these three directions, I can go here and there. I can do it this way. And a queue is used because we can say, all right, I'm going to keep track of the next particular place I want to evaluate and look at all the possible places I can go from there. That's a little outside the scope of this course, but it's very useful to keep track of, I want to put this in first. And then once it gets to its turn, then I can evaluate it. Does that make sense? All right, so with I'm going to show you a kind of a simple example of a queue. And so uh, these uh, benefits and drawbacks I've alluded to already. First in, first out, data, uh, data structure can access the front and the back. Um, unlike a stack, we can only access the front. And the drawbacks, you can't access any additional elements other than the ones at the beginning and the end. And you cannot set the maximum size of the queue. So here, um, let me go over the things you'll need to know. So pound include queue is how you include this in a code. 
and then you can call the default constructor. The up, push, and pop are used just like a stack, except push, you can think of push as push back, and pop, you can think of as pop front. But they do the same task. Let me show you what we go on here with this code. I would have in a stack, push four and push eight would give me four and eight, right? So eight would be at the top and that would be what I could evaluate. With a Q, push four and push eight is gonna be like this. And so if I say push 12, it goes there. If I call pop, that comes off of the front. And then you also have methods to access the front and the back. So if I had four, eight, and 12, front would give me four and back would give me 12. And then the last two elements that I've described on the slide, size and empty. So just like the stack, you can know how many elements are in the queue at any given moment. And also we can tell if it's empty. So we learned a little bit when we constructed our singly linked list about how this is done. So in a singly linked list and therefore a stack, we were able to say that if the head node is pointing to null, then the linked list is empty. Likewise, with the doubly linked list, if the head and tail node are both pointing at null, that means that that linked list is empty. So we call that method, that's what's actually going on underneath the hood. All right, does anybody have any questions before I continue? All right, so what I would like to do is I'm gonna show you some code that I wrote. And this code is basically gonna say where it's gonna take in a class student and we're gonna show how these containers can contain class objects. It's not just integers, floats and doubles, it's not these primitive types. So what this is going to show you is it's going to have a class student where it's going to have their name, a food item that they're going to order off a menu, and it's going to write an order program that will take their orders and show them in the order. So they're going to go through a run. It's going to represent kind of like going through the cafeteria. So let me first bring up student.h. So student.h, I have two private members that are string. And as you probably figured out, a string is another type of C++ container. It's just a standard vector that's templated to care. So we have a name and we have a main course. In the default constructor, I just call in name. And then I have a void method set main course. Then I have two methods for get name and get main course, and you'll notice that they're both const. And then a friend operator that prints out the information. In the .cpp file, I have the constructor for student. And in the constructor for student, you'll see that I set name to name in in the member initialization list. And I make the main course, I just call the default constructor for string. So that allows me to currently have a name, but we haven't ordered any food yet. For set main course, the method just reads in a string and then sets it equal to the private member main course. For get name and get main course, I just returned them. And just like before, we set them as class members because we do not change the private member of the class. And then for the operator, I print out the person says, may I please have a main course? And then I'll show you what's gonna happen in main when that actually happens. So what we're gonna use with this container for Q in qtest.cpp is I'm gonna create a standard Q of students. You see there, let me zoom in a little more so you can see. What's going on here is that the benefit of the C++ container is that 
we can represent how objects are working in the real world. And a lot of that work is being done for us. We didn't, in C, we would actually have to write up our own W link list and then write a struct that surrounds it to allow us to represent a queue. And then we'd have to come up with another struct for students. So here I can pass it to the standard container queue. And this allows me to be able to represent all of these elements without having to do as much work. So abstract some of the complexity from the user. And so here I've created uh, five students. These are the names of students I've had in the past. Um, but then what I do is I will select a specific student. I call the set main course. And then I push these students onto the queue. So it's going to be Stu Sam, uh, Stu Sam, Stu Alna, uh, Stu Ind, Alina, and Vinny are all put on there. And what's going to happen is when I get to the end, what I'm going to say is while student line is not empty, so student line is the variable name for the queue, I'm going to say, I'm going to print out the student at the front. And then I'm going to say the student gives one main course to that student. And then I'm gonna call pop on the queue and we're gonna keep going until everybody's through the line. Does everybody see that? So what's gonna happen is when I run this, so I'm gonna run make queue test. Oh, uh oh, I got there too, what happened here? I've got the wrong make file that compiled this morning. What happened? Okay, so um, let's quickly review making make files. Adapt and overcome, right? So here we have queue test. And in queue test, one of the first one I'll need is queue test.o. And that will require student.h. And the second one we would need is student.o. We have student.cpp and student.h. And I also need qtest.o, student.o. I'm going to make this compilation qtest. All right, there we go. No input files, what did I do wrong? Student.o, qtest. qtest.cpp, student.cpp, student.h. Oh, uh, that would be why. All right, there we go. So it's compiled. And now what's going to happen is we go through each of them, and then the first two comes in, and we're basically representing how you go through the line in a queue, where we have May I please have a pizza? Restaurant, I spelled restaurant. So here's one pizza. Then we have burger, pita wrap, enchilada de polo, and cheese soup to each student. So it's kind of representing going through one at a time. Does anybody have any questions about that? Yes. Sure, so um, there is 
this is something that I've alluded to briefly, and I, I don't want to go too far outside the scope of the class to answer your question, but something that's really important in classes and algorithms in particular is something called data hiding. And we do that a little bit with, um, with uh, private data members in classes. And in many algorithms, when you want to have a breadth for search is a great example of this. Sometimes you only want the user to be able to access those two types of elements for a particular task. And if that's the only one you want them to be able to access, it's in your best interest to protect the other members because then it can't be accessed. In any way. Is that a question? Any other questions? Let me look at the chat and see if anything is there in the chat. Okay, so here's all the code in the run that I just showed you. So up to this point, in C++ standard template libraries, where we've done lists, we've done stacks, we've done queues, we've done vectors, um, there are some drawbacks to all of these. And this is kind of these trade-offs would be the foundations of what would be the next course, which would be the data structure class. But for here, what I want to do is I want to give you just enough information on these pros and cons that if you wanted to use these in these um, containers and projects, you'd be able to do so. So with linked lists and vectors, we've learned about big O of n. So we require big O of n to search for a specific element. So if I had 10, 7, 5, 2, 8, and 3, for both a linked list and a vector, if I wanted to prove it was unsorted and I wanted to prove that three was in this vector, I would actually have to go through every single element and check to see if it's there. So that's one disadvantage of these uh, structures. For stacks and queues to just go along with the question that we were um, addressing, the pros of stacks and queues are also the disadvantages of stacks and queues. The pros of stacks and queues are that I do last in, first out, or first in, first out, and I can only access the front or back elements. The disadvantage is that sometimes your data structure, you might want to be able to access everything. That'd be difficult. So you want to be able to pick a specific one based on your task. Yes. Yes. Because of the pointers for the head and tail pointers, because they're pointing at those specific nodes. So, can you search through a queue? Um, if you were, you could. Um, well, okay, so I'm just going to simply say no. That the, the data structure, the way that the C container works, does not permit you to do that. Wait, isn't it just a double linked list? It's a double linked list underneath, but it specifically does not allow you to do that. For, for the reason of the, kind of the previous question I was just asking. So you know what's going underneath the hood. You know it's a double linked list and that's why it's working. But the container, think of, yeah, um, if you want, if, if we're have a vector uh, that come with a good analogy, right? Let's say we have a, uh, a cage and we have a hamster in a cage, right? And a hamster in a cage has a certain amount of food, right? And it goes up to where it can get the food and, you know, this little thing blurs out a little bit of food and can eat it, right? The hamster should only be able to access that because if it eats too much, it will die, right? We don't want to leave all of the food available because it will just eat it and eat it and eat it and eat it. There are some good reasons to not have all of the information available at any given moment. So in a, a stack or a queue, those kind of, of uh, containers are really good for those specific tasks. Okay, did I address all the questions there? So it's good that you know what's going on underneath. It helps you uh, make informed uh, coding decisions. But the question is, what if I want to try to take advantage of this being able to access everything, but I still want to be able to do fast tasks? And so this is the trade-off. And the specific container that we are going to discuss next is called a set. And a set is built off of what is known as a search tree. 
So a search tree, you've already coded one of these. Well, you haven't coded a search tree, but you have coded a tree. We have a node and you have two child pointers that point in the memory for other nodes. So you did this in your inheritance and polymorphism homework assignment. So you created a node and that node had children. And that those children were actually other pieces of information. And so the whole idea of a search tree is this allows me to say that a piece of information, let's say I have uh, 10, right? In a binary search tree, all the elements to the left will be smaller than 10, and all of the elements to the right will be greater than 10. And so we will say that the parent is 10, and if I have six and 14, for example, then what I can do is over time, I can do this dividing in half, this divide and conquer that we've already seen in uh, quick sort and insert, as a merge sort and insert sort, right? You're dividing in a half, and that allows us to get a much faster search time. So the whole goal is we're gonna get this log of n. So that's what we mean when we say we can cut in half. So if I have 32 elements in the binary search tree, I, in a best case scenario, I would be able to find it in only five decisions instead of having to go all the way through with 32. So I'm gonna go over kind of some uh, mechanisms. We're gonna build a tree together. Um, I just wanna tell you that describing how these trees work, this is like a four week long uh, portion of the data structures class where we start out with binary search trees and then we build the ABL trees and then B trees and red black trees. And by the time you'd be sick of trees, right? So we're just gonna kind of briefly go over it just enough for you to understand that this is how standard set works. So here's an example of a tree implementation. So you're familiar with the Linux system. You've gone through, you do CD for change directory, you're moving all the way through. And a Linux file system is actually a, is actually a form of a tree. And if you recall in the make file, in make clean, I have you use a command called rm-rf before you do anything else, right? So now you know enough about computing where I can explain to you precisely what this means and why we have to do it that way. So that stands for remove dash recursively force. So for example, if I wanted, I have a course here, right? So let's say you know, you're done with this class and you're like, you know what? I never want to see coding again. I'm done with my course, but I'm going to leave this. I don't think there's any evidence in my life that it exists. Here's the best way to do that. You would call rmrf course from this directory. Now it's not going to delete this one. The reason why is for the same reason that we had to go through and do that recursive call on the singly linked list. Remember when you called delete head and it went through and it would delete all the sub pointers? This is doing the exact same thing. What we're gonna do is we're actually going to go down here and then we would delete grades, prog one and prog two, and then follow five. So let me go through the animation of how this would work. We would go down there and we would first delete grades and then prog one, then prog two, then follow five. Then we'd have to delete everything to the right and then we would delete these two. Then we delete pop three, one, two, and then we delete course. So that's what the recursive uh, force is doing. It's actually going through and deleting everything from the bottom up. So that way we can preserve pointers. So pointers to a specific location 
are exactly what you created when you created file pointers in C. That's the exact thing that's going, that's going on in the Linux system. It just keeps track of where it has all those specific files. So a lot of how it, uh, computing works is based off of trees, more advanced uh, concepts. So what I would like to do is I'd like to walk through with this idea of how we would create a binary search tree. So I have a set of inserts, and this is not something I'd ask you to do on an exam, but I wanna work through this together to see if you all kind of understand this idea. So remember, it has precisely two child nodes and all the elements on the left are smaller and all the elements in the right are bigger. So I will start out, we insert 30 and 30 is just put at the beginning. So I wanna insert 20, where do you think 20 is gonna go? To the left of 30, very good. So now I want to put in 25, where do I want to put it? Any ideas? Very good, absolutely right. It'll be the right child of 20. So what's going to happen? 25 is less than 30, 20, and 25 is greater than 20. So now it's gonna go here. So very good, that's exactly right. So where's 40 gonna go? Right at 30, very good. Let me bring this up so the students in the chat can participate as well. What about 50? Yes, right at 40, very good. What about 35? Question 30, yes, in the back. Very good, it'll be the left child of 40. And now we have 10, so where's that gonna go? Yes. Very good. Does anybody not understand how I came up with that particular truth? So now let's say I wanted to prove that 25 is in the binary search tree. What do you think I would have to do? What are, what are the steps that I would need to do here? Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right. So for those of you in the chat, I'll repeat what was said. Okay, let me uh, check there's a comment there as well. And left of 20, so you're talking about 10. Okay, very good, Jacob. Um, so Jacob had the right idea as well. And what was going on here is we're saying, well, trying to prove if 25 is in the tree. And we say, well, 30, 25 is less than 30, so we go left. 25 is greater, and 25 is there. So let's say, can we prove if 27 is in the tree or not? What, which, what would I do? I'll give you a hint. Remember that when we created a node, remember the default constructor for your num for your bin node, that for the default constructor, every single node was null. So yes. <laughs> Bless you. What's up? Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good. That's exactly right. All right, let me repeat that for those of you who want to chat. So we would start out at 30, 27 is less than 30, we go left. 27 is greater than 20, we go right. 27 is greater than 25, we go right. We hit a null pointer, it's not in the tree. So absolutely 100% correct. Okay, does everybody understand that? Yes, question back. Very good. Okay, so that is why the trees and the lecture stuff and data structures 
is about four weeks long. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a very brief overview of a specific type of tree that tries to that uses what are known as balancing mechanisms to give us a level of balance. So what you are alluding to is if this was given to us in order, then what would happen is it would say 10, 20, 30, 40. It would become a glorified singly linked list, right? So that is true. I gave you one specifically that I knew would give us a really good balanced tree just to give an example. The type of tree that is built on a standard set is known as a red-black tree. And a red-black tree provides a certain form of balance. And the whole idea is that if I insert in a certain way, then it will provide some balance. And this example here, any path from what is known as the root node to any null pointer must go through the same number of black nodes. And so there are several operations that are done in order to uh, what are known as rotations based on certain cases. But in the end, what will happen is that this tree will give us a relatively good balance based on what you were just talking about. And the crucial part is it's going to be two times log base n plus one. That's the worst case scenario to get to any node in the tree. And as we know from big O notation, that if you multiply it, it's still going to give us big O log of n. Does that make sense to everybody? That just takes twice as long, but it's not like n times where if n became you know, 100 or 1,000, that would impact it. It's always going to just be worst case two times natural log of n. Did that address your question? Well, I, let, me, let me phrase what I'm going to say better. Did that address your question in a way that doesn't require giving me four more weeks of lecture to add on to the semester? All right. I'm sure none of you want that. All right, so for standard sets, this is what you'll need to know. The crucial things you need to know about standard set is that when you insert and you want to iterate through, the elements that will come out will be in sorted order. So for standard set, you have to template it. So standard set int, and I saw that int tree, you can erase and insert. And then you can determine size and if it's empty. So you know the number of elements in the tree. You will know that it would take log n to search to find if something's in there. It takes log n to insert. So it can insert a lot faster than if we were trying to do this with like a linked list or, or a pushback onto a vector. All right, does anybody uh, have any questions about that? Okay, so what I would like to do is I'd like to show you this file tree test. And so what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna go down to main. I don't wanna show you how I'm setting everything up. And then I'm gonna show you this print in order method. So here I have a standard set I insert 40 and 30, and I print in order. Then I'm going to insert 20, 60 and 20. Then I'm going to erase 40, and I'll print several times. And I'll just keep inserting and printing. So everybody see that? So the whole goal is, what should be happening after a certain set of inserts um, and erasures? And then I do the same thing with the standard string with a tree just to prove that we have some generic, that the different generic properties and we can do this and it's a good container. So I wanna show you now this print in order method. And so it's templated and I pass the standard set, it would probably even be better if I called it by reference, that's okay. Um, and then I iterate through, we have this format that we learned last week where if we wanna iterate through everything, we just have a template that's colored by reference to the current value. And 
we are iterating through the standard set print test and it's gonna print out the results. So what we expect to happen is that that's gonna print out everything in the sorted order. Now I have a question for you. Why do you think I've called this cost? Anybody have any ideas as to why I have called the iterator their cost? Yes. All right, so, the, so I, you're 95% of the way there. I want to change your uh, phrasing slightly, but you're absolutely right. Those we're calling by reference in a tree, in a binary search tree in particular, it is sorted, right? When you're calling by reference, that means we can change it. Does everybody see that? So if I have uh, 10, seven, eight, three, 15, 12, and 17, right? So this is our tree. And I'm iterating through and I get to seven. If I don't have const there, I could theoretically change this to 25. And now we have violated the ordering of the tree. So what's gonna happen is I am going to update this and I'm going to remove const from tree test.cpp. Now we see the error. So let's look at what the error and what the compiler error states. It says invalid initialization of reference type int ampersand from expression for type const int. If you don't put const in the iterator for a uh, standard set, it will not work. It will not let you do it. It will not let you call it by reference unless you also have a const. Now it's important for you to call by reference because that reduces the memory. It's also required to do so for the like a smart iterator. But the crucial thing is for a standard set, if you're iterating through it, you have to be, it has to maintain the sorted of order. So you must do that. The only way you can remove an element or change it is through insertion or erase. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay, so um, it's constant. It's able to iterate through. If I have, let me go through this again, 7, 15, The iteration performs what is known as an in-order traversal. And what it, this means is I'm gonna start here, I'm gonna go all the way left, and then when I hit the bottom, I will print out three. Then I'll go up, then I'll print out seven, and then I go right, and then I hit eight. Then it's gonna go up to the middle, and then we'll do 10. Then it will do 12, 15, and then 17. So when I do it in order, it's going to actually print it out in the sorted order that way. So what do you label like the value of the iterator? Everywhere there is pink. Like what is the The value of the iterator, what do you, I, I suppose I'm not, I'm not following what you're asking. All right, so when you have, when you have a normal iterator, right? When you're iterating from I, in I equals zero through N, right? You're keeping track of the specific locations and it gives you a specific result. So this particular, uh, it, when we've learned this new format, it has to go through every possible thing. Right? So in this case, the iterator is actually looking for either elements that have null pointers initially, 
or we're going to do this is known as an in order traversal which is going to go left middle and then right so here's how it goes if we are not if both of them aren't null then initially we have to go left all so far then we have to go this way and so if you're asking can i get the sixth element um it, it's not possible to do that with a standard set like dot at six that's not going to happen you have to return the specific location of the element so here it's going to get to three and then it'll print it out then it's going to say well that's the end of that so we are going to go back up so this is recursive and it's going to say three seven and then it's going to go right it's going to hit null then, okay, we've already done this. So now we're in the middle. Now it's gonna do 10. Now we're gonna go right. Now we're at the subtree. So we go left, 12, we hit the bottom. We go up to 15. And then we go right to 17. All right, so what is the less? I was just really kind of trying to figure this out. I want to think that we had like here or four, like it's just saying. Oh, yeah, so forgive me. I, I'm going to cut you off. The reason why is not because we have time to get It's because the crucial thing I want you to take away from this if I iterate it through, it's going to turn out a lot. And if you want to search for something, it's going to take a lot of time. What you're asking about, forgive me, is there's a lot of theory that goes into answering. I can see where your question is going. And it's a bit outside the scope of the class. I just want to run the, the actual code through this. And, uh, I'm happy. If you want to come by office hours, I'm happy to go, up, go into the uh, details of that. But the short answer of it is that by using recursion and traversals, kind of like what you did when you called cal, right? When you called cal, it went left. Remember that? It went left and then performed those calculations and then went right and performed all those calculations and then you combined it and returned the result. Remember that? What you're doing in here is you would just go, all right, I'm going to call left, and then when I get to a node that has two null pointers, I'm just going to print it out. So it's actually going to recursively call it. So it's not this not conventional iterator in the sense that if I say give me dot at seven, it will give me that result. Is that Thank you. I, and I apologize for not being able to go into more detail. And so there we go, we've compromised the integrity of the tree. So let me run, so we have, uh, I'm gonna put const back in here. And that's another, and to follow up another, this is why we have to put in const because that's to maintain the integrity of the tree, not like some sort of uh, ordering like we would have with other things. All right, there compiled. And so initially, what we have in this code is 40 and then 30, but we see that it's sorted. And then I put in 60 and 20, and we see that I go through and it prints everything out in order. I remove, I call it erase 40, and we see that I did this here. Then I insert 40, 50, and then 50, now standard set only allows you to insert one element of a type. So we see that I don't have duplicate elements of 50. And then the rest of it, rest of them go in order. So at one point I'm deleting and then I insert 35 and then I insert all of the uh, strings there like so. Okay, does anybody have any other questions about this? All right, so the last container I would like to show you is called a hash map. So a hash map, the whole idea is that you use, it uses a standard pair, so we're familiar with standard pairs. And it uses, it allocates a certain amount of memory, and it uses a key, which can be any type that you use, as long as it's deterministic, meaning not float or double. 
And then you can insert that into a function and that will give you the location of the other value. So it's the general idea with a hash map, they're typically also known as associated arrays. And for uh, the brevness of time, I won't read Gail McDowell's uh, quote, other than to say that hash tables are very common if you are trying to prepare for job interviews. So you're familiar with hash, hash functions and how they've generally worked already. In that, you're familiar with them in switch statements. So the switch statement, you put in something that jumps straight to a specific case, right? So with if else, you have to evaluate every single one, whereas with a, a uh, switch statement, we would put in a function and it would tell me how many instructions I would need to jump down in order to be able to execute it. So it runs faster than if else statement. That is using a hash map. So it tells me specifically where I need to go. So that's what's going on here. I put in some sort of key, it goes into a function, and it gives me an array index. And the whole goal is very fast. Big all of one lookup time. Right, so switch statements, I'm just gonna quickly go through this. We see it goes directly to the value and then it's done. We don't have to do anything else and requires a default. So that way, if we don't put in anything, then we don't, we, uh, we, it goes to, and performs a specific set of tasks. So switch statements, I just told you that. Remember for, so switch statements, you just go, we go all the way back to instruction memory and we have that switch function. We get the value from the register. We perform the hash function. And that value, oh, I, the colors are this way in the text, but we send it back and we go to that next location in instruction memory. Okay, I mentioned that. All right, so key value lookups. So in an age hash, the difference with, the, so the type of container is known as unordered map. The ordering is done by the key. And if you don't mind, I'm going to zoom in here and show you standard unordered map. The key is a string and the int is the value. So I'm defining it, Matthew 38, Alfred 72, Grace 14, James 35. The, the good thing about using a hash table is that here I have age hash James. And what this will do is this will return the value at that location. James is put into the hash function and it's going to return to the plot. And then we see that. If not, I'm happy to uh, answer a question. And it will just print out the numbers at that specific place. So if I run make age hash, It prints out the specific value. The other thing I would like to show you in the last two minutes before we conclude lecture. Okay, so I described all that. So hash functions can be really good if you have, need a large distribution of keys, such as you're trying to keep track of Notre Dame net IDs. All right, counting sort. The whole idea behind counting sort is that I have a certain range of numbers. So let's say I have one, three, four, three, two, seven, and nine. What this is gonna use, it's gonna use what's known as a histogram, where I'm gonna create a certain number of buckets to keep track of all the possible values. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, and they're all initially zero, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to increment the values at that location. So here I have one and I'll hash to one and I'll increment that by one. Three, I'll hash to three. Four, I'll hash to four. Three, I'll do two. Two, I'll go to one. Seven, I'll do one. And then nine, I will do one. 
And then what's going to happen is I will iterate through this. And then I would emit. So here I'd say, well, I have one. So I have one here. Then I have two. So I'll say two. Here I have two of these. So I'll say three and three. I have one four. I have one seven. And I have one nine. So by using this counting sort, if we know a specific range of numbers, we can take advantage of this to be able to sort all of the values. And this can be done very fast. So what I'm going to do on Wednesday is I'm going to go over the last little bit of my description of hash functions. And then I'm going to uh, do a, 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 a summation of the course. And then I'm going to conduct a final exam. Okay, so uh, does anybody have any questions? All right, on that note, you are all dismissed. I'll see you on Wednesday. to another class. You are One third.
One more. One more after this. Let me see. 